morning and uh, welcome to the uh, power of collaborative thought. Thank you, Sanjeev, for the wonderful introduction. And I'm glad to uh, see everybody here this morning. So, so why, are we, why are we here today? We are here to talk about many of our successful organizations, large and small, that are now facing the economic, social, cultural, environmental, energy and technology challenges and risks of the 21st century. We're here to talk about the progress of the 21st century and, and the challenges that, that, that it brings. Progress such as the economic influence of social media and social movements, the recognition of radical environmental changes that may cause risk to supply chains, distribution channels, and infrastructure resilience, big data analytics, and the Internet of Things that can cause emerging technical solutions to, to overtake or revolutionize traditional industries. With this progress and evolution, what happens to energy utilities and, or, and retail competitive suppliers when they face competition that they're not accustomed to? Competition like Google and Accenture, and competition that is not traditional to their industries. Companies are now competing with companies that are outside of their industries in ways that they had not anticipated or reflected as a part of their competition. What has happened to organizations, governments, and even countries that have ignored social media and its influence on social movements over the past 10 years? What has happened to political uh, campaigns in the last 12 years that use traditional methods to compete against things like big data analytics, rapid communication, and automated logistics management? They've had real challenges. These challenges are volatile and amoebic in nature as they shift and change, not only quarterly, but even at times hourly. These are challenges that, that shake and shift economies, markets, and the long-term plans of our corporations and organizations. Industries and organizations are now pushed to, to transform, to, to pivot, to innovate to collaborate in order to prosper, and in sometimes even in order to survive. To remain relevant and competitive, we must be open to change. But the cultures within our organizations must also be nimble and resilient, scalable, adaptable, and prepared for the change. We have to ask ourselves a question. Do our cultures force us to stick with the status quo, ignoring the need for transformation, or do our cultures encourage the power of original thought? How do we react to thought that is different? Thought that challenges the proposed solutions and assumptions of our superiors or the majority in our organizations. Is the imperative for continuous original thought the foundation of our corporate strategy going forward? Leadership in the 21st century has a responsibility toward real-time diverse and collaborative original thought. Thought that is adaptive and sustainable. Thought that reflects the advantage of the collective. And thought that consistently gets you to the finish line first. In starting our discussion today, let's first take a look at the very definition of thought. Now, according to Webster, thought is an idea, a plan, an opinion, a picture, that is formed in your mind, something that you think of, it is the act or process of thinking. But what is original thought? Can original thought actually exist? Is it scientifically, spiritually, or even physically possible for there to be thought that stands alone, one that has no prior influence from history or an aggregation of experiences, ideas, thoughts or methods? Is original thought a permutation, an evolution, or a collaboration that transcends time and source and space and, and even individuals? I would argue something radical today. I would argue that isolated original thought standing on its own does not exist. As a man of faith, I would argue that the only original thought that existed is the original thought of God in the beginning. And, every, and, and that every thought after that thought is a derivative of that original thought. Can I at least get a reluctant witness in here, amen? <laughs> we are all in the same way, shape, or form, whether it be intellectually, spiritually, or even psychologically, 
dependent on the collaboration of thought which came before us and the perception of thought that will follow us. Our very existence is predicated on the metaphor of original thought. For original thought is a dynamic, it's dynamic and it's continuous. It is the opportunity for the integration of diverse collaboration as well as opposing thoughts and methods to be exposed to one another until a solution is developed that benefits all. Let me, re let me, let me say that once again so that we're clear on that. This is the premise of this, this, this discussion today. Original thought is the opportunity for the integration of diverse collaboration as well as opposing thoughts and methods to be exposed to one another until a solution is developed that benefits all. When Albert Einstein developed the theory of relativity, everybody knows this E equal mc squared, in 1905, he was influenced by prior thoughts in 1904 from the Dutch physicist Henrik Lorenz on transformation. He was also influenced by Edward Morley and A. A. Michelson on their speed of light theories from the 1800s, and they were influenced by Isaac Newton before them. We also see the power of original thought in social movements and revolutions, such as the American Revolution, which was influenced by the prior tax movement in 1765. The abolition of slavery movement in the 1800s had a religious influence from the northern states and from the economics of the time. The Industrial Revolution, which was a period between 1860 and 1940, in which rural societies in Europe and America became industrial out of the economic necessity from the decrease in slave labor. Industrialization leveraged innovation, simple machines, in order to achieve mass production. Industrialization also improved the standard of living for some, while resulting in grim employment and living conditions for the poor and working classes. Now, born out of this, this grim condition was the organized labor movement in the midst of the Great Depression, which brought on the culmination of a new deal from the Roosevelt administration. And later on, the Civil Rights Movement was greatly influenced by the organized labor movement. All of the methods of organization and boycotting from the previous movement was now used in the Civil Rights Movement. His strategy was also informed by the great theologian Howard Thurman, whose thoughts were greatly influenced by the methods of nonviolent civil disobedience with Mahatma Gandhi. Now let us fast forward to 2008 and the global financial crisis, where the average tenure of a CEO was at a, an all-time low of three and a half years. In industry after industry, this crisis forced unprecedented innovation, consolidation, and even collaboration, not against but with competition in order for entire industries to survive. Costs were going up while profits were decreasing. There were government entities operating, state entities operating in a state of bankruptcy. Individual households were making far less but working longer hours and not working at all. This crisis truly spawned the current technology and energy revolution that we see converging. Through technology innovation, along with expansion and diversity in energy, such as the current tapestry of uh, both traditional and renewable sources, expenditures within households begin to decrease. Corporations and government, the decreases in, in, in expenditures were as much as 5 to 20 percent of the overall expense of those entities. This adjustment to energy generation and consumption is currently the foundation for economic recovery since 2008. It is also a huge part of the foundation for the growth projection of both this country domestic, domestically and the economic outlook globally going forward. Each of these movements and challenges were undergirded by the lessons, approaches, and methodologies of historical movements that preceded them. Each of these movements achieved the level of success through relentless, collaborative, and most of all, diverse original thought. But what then is the true definition of diversity? Is it a noun, a verb, an attitude, an action? What types of limits do we, in our own settings, put on diversity? When we think about diversity in our, in our own context, it must be greater than a checkbox of gender or ethnicity sexual orientation, age, ability, 
or disability. It should be inclusive of uncompromised individual equity, unlimited data, groups, organizations, space, time, languages, devices, ethnicities, experiences, thoughts, or cultures. Diversity fortifies adaptability, scalability, sustainability, and acceptance of solutions that build foundations for continuous transformation. But what does diversity look like in our own personal experiences and in our organizations? Let me share a story with you, a personal story. In my own experience, almost 30 years ago after graduating from the George Washington University, I was a computer science and statistics major, and I, I, I was a, a captain of the tennis team. I went there on a tennis scholarship. And, and you know, after two-a-day practices, I, I was, I remember every night I would go to, to the computer lab at school. And at this particular computer lab, there was a homeless man. He was a, he was a former Vietnam vet. And I remember this man. This man would, he would encourage me when I was discouraged. He would speak life into me and hope. And, and I remember this man saying to me, when you get discouraged, when you, when, you, when you don't believe anymore, get down on your knees. You get down on your knees, it's physically and spiritually impossible for you to fail or fall. This homeless man spoke life into me that I didn't realize. This, this man that I looked at that I wanted to walk past spoke life into me. Now, the one thing that I didn't realize was that four years after graduating from the George Washington University, that the company I, I worked for almost 30 years ago in a month from today would call me in and I would lose my job. And I too would be homeless, right along the I Street corridor, a few blocks away from GW where I went to school at. But I remembered what this homeless man would say to me. I remembered those lessons, and, and those lessons reminded me of lessons from my grandmother that I received before leaving New York to come down to the George Washington University to go to school. It was very powerful. It, 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 it moved me, it changed me, it made me realize how critical it was not to not to look at things when I'm dealing with people and looking at people for what they seemed. When I'm dealing and interacting with people in any form of a collaborative manner in order to achieve a goal that benefits the collective. You see, diversity of thought is stopping and being patient and allowing room for transparency from others. Diversity of thought is, is listening even in the most unlikely places like some of you might do today in listening to a former homeless guy that's now a C-level executive, amen? And later on when I was at Netscape, the first browser company in the early 1800s, uh, 19, early 1990s. <laughs> early 1800s, that'd be some technology, huh? <laughs> Most technology companies were, were closed and proprietary and controlled and, and secretive. You know, Netscape aggressively pushed open technology at the end of the, the 20th century through a new concept called Mozilla, a global virtual forum for sharing of open source to, to strengthen function, uh, the functionality of the Netscape browser. And, and Microsoft, they, they kicked our butts. And commercially, Mozilla failed pretty miserably. But when we look today at successful software mo and mobile apps, and websites and, and technology solutions. It is hard to find solutions that are not founded on synthesized open source code from all over the world. You see, diversity of thought is examining and sometimes even incorporating previous failure in order to achieve going forward success. Now, as mentioned earlier in, 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 in the energy space um, the two, in the two, during the 2008 financial crisis, it exposed our national security also and our need for energy independence. It forced the, the United States of America to, to achieve diversity of original thought through not only open technology, but also open innovation, and even collaboration between solutions, resources, and approaches. You see, there is no longer dependence 
on foreign oil in the same way. But now a diverse landscape of affordable, adaptable energy solutions that include clean natural gas, solar, wind, biofuels, combined heat and power, emerging storage solutions, hopefully will emerge even further, nuclear generation, integrated conservation, and even energy efficiency measures that were not used as strongly as they were prior to 2008. You know, and these solutions are now driving economic development in our towns and cities through gas infrastructure expansion and microgrids and eco districts and, the, and clean power plant implementations between cities, states, and counties. And so we have to realize that diversity of thought is the blending of formally competing solutions to form a scalable and adaptable consortium that can overcome unpredictable challenges in the future. Diversity is diversity not only in ethnicity, Diversity is diversity in resources and approach and solutions and even listening. Diversity is now evolving at a light speed pace through the use of technology in the 21st century. Now, prior to 21st century technology, the, the convergence of diverse original thought and collaboration was limited to time and space. No longer are we limited by isolation or the particular. Through rapid and constant real-time technology access, there is an authentic ability for limitless universal thought when solving transformative problems. The difference between companies or organizations that will embrace diverse collaboration versus that which will not equals the level of risk they will navigate in order to achieve long-term and sustainable success. In the 21st century, technology advancement in mobile communications the Internet of Things and Big Data Analytics now strives to connect us all, truly, real time. Mobile devices in the 21st century, whether it be small tablets or small computers or watches, have the computing power of some supercomputers of the last century, I know, because I was there programming in some of those languages very early in the 80s. Now, now this allows dynamic and continuous intentional and, and, and unintentional problem solving through a connected global and collaborative cloud of information, real time, anywhere. Now when we play video games, we no longer play just with a kid in the room. We play with the kid in Australia and the kid in Germany and the kid in China and the kid in Russia, all simultaneously, real time. The current generation after the millennials, this new generation Z, is an intellectual, spiritual, technological, and biological fusion of thought from birth. If you go in the airport, babies not yet talking are navigating through phones and, and touch screens and, and, and really making progress. And you watch them and say, oh, they're just tapping. And then you see, no, they're playing a game. No, they're actually examining something. They're actually thinking. It is incredible. This connected communication metaphor is now evolving even to the Internet of Things. And this Internet of Things is the internetworking of devices and vehicles and buildings and other items embedded with electronics, software, sensors, actuators, and network connectivity that enable these objects to collect and exchange data real time. In a recent article by Daniel Burris of, of Burris Research and Wired Magazine, he gave an outstanding example. In 2007, a bridge collapsed in Minnesota, and unfortunately, many people died uh, during the collapse primarily because of the steel plates are inadequate to handle the bridge's load. But now when we rebuild bridges, we can use smart cement equipped with sensors to monitor stresses and cracks and warpages within those types of structures. And this same sensor can be used to mix sensors in the cement so that when there's ice uh, on the bridge, the sensors can let the car know through the, the wireless internet that there is ice and the car will automatically ask the driver to slow down. And if the car, if the driver doesn't slow down, then the car will slow down automatically. And this is powerful. I, mean, I can't think of an industry where this type of evolving technology is not going to be relevant. And the Internet of Things will, will further enhance big data analytics as well. And big data analytics is essentially risk neutralization through big data analytics is a modern day actuarial approach to risk mitigation. Big data analytics is the process of examining large data sets to, to uncover uh, hidden patterns, large, large uh, data sets, 
unknown correlations, market trends, customer preferences, and other useful business and personal information. Collaborative big data analytics creates an adaptive and scalable model for resilient long-term risk mitigation and business success. But what then is collaboration? Collaboration is the process of two or more people or organizations working together to realize or achieve something successfully. Collaboration is when we are more closely aligned than cooperation. Now, both collaboration and cooperation are the opposite of competition. But collaboration without diversity and access is not collaboration. It is only the veneer of collaboration. It is, the polite, it is polite correspondence. It is diplomatic appeasement. It is going to great lengths to give the perception of at least short-term cooperation without risk. In the 21st century, true collaboration transcends individuals and economics and, and cultures and ethnicities and previous limitations and, and prejudices and internal competition and persistent challenges. Collaboration allows institutional knowledge and new thinking to propel companies, organizations, and individuals forward over and through their collective challenge. When I think about collaboration, I can't help but to think about my daughter, Naya, who five years ago was 11 years old. And I remember her being up in her room and surfing for two hours uh, on the internet of things that she wanted to buy. And I remember her coming downstairs and, and calling my wife to the kitchen table, my wife and I. And she said, I've been a, I've been a great student. I, I've danced at, at Dance Theater of Harlem and Alvin Ailey and, and, and other things in the summer times have done really well. And I do all the things that you asked me to do when I'm a, a good kid. And then she, she took her list that she had developed for two hours and she slid it across the table as if she were doing a negotiation. She is our negotiating child. And she said, these are the things that I'm expecting for Christmas. And then she turned around and she walked right back upstairs. And so I, I, you know, I look at the list and I sum it all up and it's $20,000. And so I called upstairs and I said, Naya, come, come back downstairs right now. And when she came back downstairs, I said, Naya, what you're getting for Christmas is you're going to start a co-drive. Now, I was shocked at her response. This Generation Z kid took a deep breath. She turned around and went back upstairs. And the first thing that she did is she, she began to get on the internet and she started sending emails and texts and, and messages to her relatives and, and friends and to her, her teachers and her principal. And by the end of the week, she had three co-drives going on at three different schools. And she had recruited grocery stores like Giant and Safeway and the Dutch Market. And she had gone to clothing stores and gotten excess clothing from the clothing stores. And before we knew it, she actually had organized something in our house a few weeks later, where they would put together hundreds of coats and hats and gloves and toiletry items and, and food and lunches for, for the homeless. And then they went out to parks throughout the District of Columbia, and they fed homeless women and men and children. This was really, really powerful to me, to examine the fact that the way in which these children had done it, this, these Generation Z children, they weren't worried about individual accolades. They weren't competing with one another. But what happened is their focus was first on the collective, and then their contribution to the collective in order to make a difference for all. This was really a powerful experience in collaboration that we had seen. But our generation is quite different from my daughter's. We were taught to magnify and to notice our differences while playing nice in the sandbox from an early age to be polite and cordial while in the sandbox, to share in the sandbox, to proclaim boldly and, and outwardly that we desire to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. But we were never taught to truly collaborate without prejudice in the sandbox. If we are all honest with, uh, with ourselves, we know this today to be true. 
And what was never acknowledged was the contradiction in education that we've received throughout the rest of our childhood and our lives. To expand this polite and cordial sandbox to be a competitive sandbox, where there is only an appearance of collaboration and where individual and even petty competition is priority. This competitive sandbox divides our spirit and contradicts even the human genome, which itself represents collaboration and diversity. If all of us in this room were to take a DNA genetics test from Ancestor.com or 23andMe, I think that we would find that there would be more similarity than difference in our genetic makeup. Someone with African appearance may be 50% African, 35% European, and the remainder South American. Someone with European-American features may be 50% European-American, 20% Asian, and the remainder of it Canadian or, some, or Australian or some other part of the world. We have to realize that we are more similar than different. Far too often our response is individual survival, division, or gravitation toward the familiar. At WGL, we experienced all of the aforementioned. The essence of WGL's transformation was the shift from siloed thinking to collaborative original thought. On my first day at WGL in May of 2014, the first thing that I'd done when I got to my desk was to turn on my computer and to bring up the internet. And when I, when I brought up the internet, I was completely shocked. The, the, the fonts were different. Um, the, the sizing of the fonts and images were different. There was, there was no continuity or collaboration between the graphics on the page. I, I literally thought it was a, a letter from a, a, you know, a serial killer. <laughs> so the first thing I did was I called information technology and I said, something's wrong with my computer. You have to come down here and fix this problem. I, I must have done something wrong. I turned my computer on and it's not working. And so information technology came to my desk, and when they came to my desk, they said, nothing's wrong. This, this, this intranet was, is a version of Lotus Notes from 1998. I couldn't believe it. That's what I was dealing with. Enough said, right? But when I arrived at WGL and, and its affiliate companies as a vice president and chief revenue officer, uh, or the, the, the head of sales, marketing, and corporate communications. The organization, like so many energy uh, utilities, was contemplating how it would pivot or transform to face a torrid convergence of revolutions happening in the global economy in 2014. There was the abundance of natural gas to the shale gas revolution. The, the renewable energy revolution that had accelerated in response to the need for uh, energy independence and financial recovery from the 2008 financial crisis was converging with the shale gas revolution. There was a pending revolution of unlikely competition from organizations like Amazon and, and Google and, and Accenture, and even General Electric. WGL Holdings, and in particular its core affiliate Washington Gas, an almost 170-year-old energy utility was now facing market erosion from a multitude of competitive alternative energy sources. In 2014, the polar vortex also hit, and we experienced a multi-year stock price low of $36. It was a price that made the company extremely vulnerable to the marketplace. Our CEO, Terry McAllister, was clear. We had to move, and we had to move fast. But the question still loomed. How would a company that experienced three separate centuries transform overnight? Was there even the corporate culture, capacity, or appetite to truly change in order to achieve such a goal? Was there room for collaborative original thought between May 2014 and January 2015 when we were going to deal with both the rebranding and transformation launch of the company? Could we deal with the pressure that we had in order to grow? First on the agenda was to pinpoint every single stakeholder and all their direct reports and establish those that would contribute to diverse and collaborative original thought. And there ended up being 175 people from every corner in the company who in some way would be involved in the process. It also included the vast majority of 20 contractors and consultants that we worked with within the company. Planning meetings took place with individuals and communications and 
investor relations and public policy and regulatory affairs and pipeline investment and sales and marketing and engineering and project management and operations and information technology and even in fleet management. It was a diverse group with strong, almost violent predispositions, competing thoughts, competing processes, competing agendas, and habitual methodologies. We met and we met and we met and we met. And we really started to make progress when our team of diverse contributors realized and accepted that our work involved a fundamental, indeed a metaphysical change in the way we thought and talked about our business, structured it, and sold our products and services. We realized that our differences were our strength. Our differences were our strength. Our differences were our strength. This quickly brought us to the examination of the way WGL sold, or in some sense, didn't sell its products. From my first conversation with our senior management on, I had emphasized one thing. We needed to change the way we addressed the market, reorienting the company from a demand pull model to a supply push model into the marketplace. And we asked ourselves many tough questions, like why are we changing? What are we selling? How are we selling? What, who is doing the selling? What are we saying? And quite frankly, what are we gonna call it? These questions forced us to include not only ideas from the current contributors, but previous thoughts and actions from years prior to contribute to collaborative original thought. And the team was really fortunate. In 2008, Terry McAllister, then a newly appointed CEO, had the foresight to approach our board of directors with the idea of diversifying the company's offerings. And by the time I first sat down at my desk in May of 2014, the company had already developed substantial capabilities in solar production. We had put in place organizational structure to develop projects at a national level, developed a thorough understanding of our our abilities and how to deal with these projects. We established our, the perception in the marketplace as a company that would deliver that in fact it, 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 it was convicted to deliver. And our effort to get the word out, we had come up with a slogan back in 2013. And that slogan was a gauntlet thrown out to the company by our CEO saying WGL, energy answers, ask us. But it lacked it still lacked integrity. We could not just state it. We had to become energy answers, ask us. And this effort laid some of the groundwork for what I came to describe as a four-pillared chief revenue officer or CRO approach to the transformation. And it included internal readiness, infrastructure readiness, market readiness, and sales readiness. In addition to internal conversations with all 1,200 employees, we needed to ensure that the company's officers and executive management were aligned in terms of how we dealt with internal readiness. We also developed and distributed both physical and virtual regulatory guidelines, a phased customer service alignment, and a comprehensive communications plan. In terms of infrastructure readiness, remember my previous frustration with our internet? That was one of the high things on our list. And so we accelerated development and implementation of a new intranet between May and the fall of 2014 to be deployed prior to the launch that would happen in January. We also developed and redeveloped no less than seven different external websites for all of the affiliate companies that was deployed in January of 2015. We trained people in content management in all 24 functional areas throughout WGL and its affiliates. We reskinned trucks and vans and uniforms and signs and buildings, launched a new energy management platform and completed the branding consolidation of WGL Energy Services and WGL Energy Systems as one entity in WGL Energy. In terms of market readiness, we, we brought together previously competing best-in-class marketing partners and vendors with the goal which we met of being ready to hit the market in six months. But I have to tell one funny incident where during our first meetings with that group, here you have 18 or 20 different marketing vendors, as competitive as, as they can be in a, in a marketing charrette, and sitting down with them in that first meeting and saying, you're all going to work together. 
You're not going to compete. <laughs> You're going to align. And we're going to get this done in six months. And they all looked at me and said, you are absolutely crazy. But they did it. These folks that previously competed, these folks that had redundant jobs for, uh, that they worked with the organization on, found a way to deal with collaborative original thought. And we were successful. This included the development of comprehensive messaging, a corporate-wide historical content audit and update capability, the establishment of graphic standards and logo guidelines, and guidelines for all new content development, including social media, which prior to that was not relevant at WGL or its affiliate companies. We developed extensive sales collateral and a channel's marketing strategy and a schedule for more than 120 events that would go on externally outside for WGL and its affiliates. We set up a speakers bureau for our executives and executive management to be prepared to have discourse about the new direction of the organization. We put a PR plan in place and integrated all of the messaging within our investor relations function in that six months. In terms of sales readiness for both the utility and non-utility businesses established quarterly business reviews, something that had never happened within the organization. We even uh, integrated something that, to deal with risk mitigation called deal review that looked at complex transactions and transactions that were not traditional in order to mitigate risk through feedback from functional areas throughout the organization. We put forecasting and customer relationship management capabilities in place. We reviewed change in, and compensation structures throughout the sales organization in order to motivate the organization to achieve the, the very strong growth goals that we had put out there in the marketplace. And then we developed a comprehensive sales strategy that was not myopic in nature. It was not just for a year, but it was over 5, 10, 15 years, and it mapped directly to our long-range plan financially as it relates to the corporation's very, very aggressive growth plan. And bluntly put, our first six months was a war room type of approach. But when it was time to, to roll out our new Energy Answers brand in January of 2015, we were ready. We, we had seen the manifestation of what could happen when you come together to deal with collaborative original thought, even if it's not comfortable. And at the end of FY 2015, our net income was $131 million, dramatically up from $105 million the previous year. Our earnings per share was up by almost 18% in one year. And our retail energy marketing segment adjusted EBIT was $68.5 million, as compared to just $10.7 million the year before, almost a 540% increase. Our commercial energy systems adjusted EBIT was $16.8 million, as compared to $4.5 million the year before, almost a 273% increase. And our stock has gone from $36 to as high as $73 a share as of March of 2016. This did not happen out of evolution. This did not happen out of chance. It happened out of the result of folks coming together that did not normally come together. It happened out of collaborative original thought. Our need to transform caused us to experience the power of collaborative thought. As you leave today, remember one thing. Our most original thoughts and solutions to risk, crisis and problems, arrive through a tapestry of diverse voluntary or involuntary collaboration across space, time, traditional, and non-traditional methods. Thank you. <laughs>